The Digital Public Library of America is an open access repository for over 8 million items collected from about 1,300 institutions, libraries, archives, museums, historic sites from across the United States. Mm -hmm. Launched about 18 months ago in April 2013, and I'm talking to you now in November 2014. We are a huge digital attic that supplements what's going on in physical libraries. And I think what people don't realize is physical libraries exist for many, many different purposes. First of all, they're, for the foreseeable future, still going to be the place where you're going to get the latest you know, Stephen King novel. You're not going to find it through DPLA. We're simply not going to be able to license that material on an open basis. So there, there's some material which will still remain at the public library. But the public library, and I work in one, you know, exists for, all, for communal meetings and talks, um, it exists for you know, private study, it exists for local history and local history collection, it exists for amateur enthusiasts, there's just a wide range of things that the local institution can do and as I mentioned in response to a question from the audience today, we'd love to see local institutions, local libraries in fact, take control of their chunk of the DPLA and provide some curation to that because we can't do that at a national level. Um, so, um, you know, we've got a great mission, which is that we present all this material on our, on our website at dp.la. And then we also have a data platform for others to reuse these same materials in whatever they want, an app, um, an educational um, web application, um, anything that they want, they can take our data and use it as they, as they may. So in, in the planning phase, we had a two and a half year planning phase, and there were many models that were experimented with and, and tried out. Um, um, many of which sort of ended up in one form or another on the site. So the map idea, I think, came out of that beta period on it. Um, some of the faceted searching and modes of searching were also sort of borrowed from existing projects. So, um, so I, I think we've, we've had a lot of planning around it and um, uh, I think incorporated a lot of that material as well. But um, um, there are many other kinds of interfaces. There were ones that used um, much more um, sort of scientific metric kinds of approaches with graphs, kind of like that one that you saw with the business um, tag on it where it would be more like a, a bar graph across time. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of used to those kinds of interfaces, but they're maybe not a populist uh, interface. So we're getting progress on, on all kinds of fronts. I mean, the, just the sheer numbers of institutions involved. I mentioned 1,300 contributing institutions up from 500 when we launched. So there's a snowball effect going on there. Um, so there, there's certainly sort of numbers that I could point to, but I think the most important things are where we hear about great applications used in the classroom, you know, specific syllabi that make use of one of our um, exhibits, for instance, that I showed earlier today, um, or just general enthusiasts, I mean, amateur enthusiasts. We had, um, uh, after we launched, we heard from a, um, a guy in Australia who found a picture of his grandmother from one of our hubs, I think it was the hub in Utah, had posted this image of his grandmother and he had been searching, I think, for his family name in our massive archive and found her in this and said, oh my gosh, that's my grandmother there. And so I think there's lots of little stories like that that to us are extremely valuable even though they're not in some sense monetized like a Silicon Valley company or, or has some kind of um, massive number attached to it. Well, I think, you know, we fit in extremely well to OER in that we are bringing together the openly available materials from all of these libraries, archives, and museums. So there are materials that are out there, but you probably could never find them even with a Google search. I brought up this example in the talk I just gave of materials from Goodhue uh, County Historical Society um, in, in Minnesota, um, which is simply, you know, they're somewhere out there on the web, but um, if you're someone who's building OER syllabi or textbooks and you wanted to try to find those materials, it's very unlikely you'd be able to find them. So what DPLA does really well is it makes it, those materials discoverable through multiple interfaces. You can actually use a map-based interface to zoom right in to that part of Minnesota and find those materials and wherever you're looking for them. Business history, there's incredible. I mean, we have, um, we just had a, a blog post that went up yesterday from uh, Hennepin County in, actually in Minnesota, again, that um, they just digitized their business holdings from the county library, and that includes things like trade manuals and um, um, company logos and cards and marketing brochures um, uh, throughout time. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of rich stuff like that when you get down into it. I'm sure we have 
things related to stock proceeds and company filings. We have, um, I had a slide that you may have missed, but we have um, uh, corporate archives, actually. We have material from corporate archives in the DPLA that you can find as well. Um, it's not a huge part of our collection. I think it's about 2%, but 2% of 8 million is actually a <laughs> significant portion, and I'd love to get more corp corporate archives. There are a lot of major corporations in the United States that have extremely good and actually very valuable archives. IBM, for instance, has a terrific archive um, in their campus in New York. So, um, so I think there's a lot that we can do on that end that would provide, in a sense, context, business plans, marketing materials, all kinds of things that you could imagine um, using in a business school. Um, I also think, you know, if you're into digital things and you're in a business school, you can build apps. I mean, you can build a commercial app off of the DPLA if you wanted to try to do that. We're completely okay with someone trying to do that. Um, in fact, we have an entity, EBSCO, that actually has, in a sense, an app that integrates our data. And um, we'd love to see people experiment with it. I mean, um, uh, Ken Lane, who was in the audience, he, he brought up um, uh, um, the, um, what was it? Um, you know, local app building for tourism reasons. Right, yeah, that. and um, we're very interested in that. I mean, no one's really done a great one yet. There's that the open picks phone app, but I think there'd be a lot more that are related to, um, you know, what's in Washington. You could create a whole app based just on that. So I think a lot of that relates to um, the, the behind the scenes things that I talked about um, moments ago, which are that you really have to do the hard work of making sure the data is really good, the descriptive metadata um, that really is at the core of what DPLA or anything like it is doing. Um, so we have 1,300 institutions. They probably have 1,300 different databases that they've exported from to get into the DPLA, and we have to make sure that those blend together in one seamless whole, and that means making decisions about which fields should match with uh, which other fields in our internal standard, and then how to make those kinds of transitions, and making sure that we also add in additional data, like geographic data, so you can find them on the map. So you, it's, it's really a process of making sure you have a really rigorous database and doing a lot of kind of uh, quality assurance, essentially, on, on the data so that it actually works in the interfaces. Because if you, if you start at the front end, if you just think you're going to make a great website and you'll have all the materials from your country, it just simply doesn't work out that way just to get even the scans. And I think we've all seen um, other projects that have done a lot of scanning, per se, right, digitizing the actual objects but don't have good descriptive metadata and very full, you know, filled out descriptive metadata. And so really at the core what we're doing is making sure not just that there are these openly available scanned items, but to also make sure that we've, we've got the data so you can actually find them. I mean, we're already at a scale at 8 million, soon to be 80 million, where it's going to be very, very hard to find materials unless you really have detailed information about them. We're still a little bit too list view right now versus what you know, I think I'd like to see. I'd love to have more that are, are more visual. Um, I showed one, I, I gave a talk yesterday that um, you know, showed what you could do with extremely small um, thumbnails. You, know, you can fit about 1,600 thumbnails on a screen, actually, on a, on a standard laptop screen. So um, the human eye is extremely good, actually, with noticing things at scale, um, surprisingly good. It can pick out color at very, very small um, variations in, in a gridded format. Um, so um, if, you, if you look at user interface design, you can really leverage that kind of, of scaled um, uh, image. And that's a key part of, you know, I've, I've emphasized a lot of the tech data stuff, but really it comes down to human beings. And one of the, I think the great things about our models, it, our, the, the model that we operate under is we aren't just sort of slurping in this data from all around the country from little places. It actually goes in through these hubs that are based in each of the United States. So our hub in Minnesota took that material from a small place, right, Red Wing, Minnesota in Goodhue County, um, into their state-based hub. And they have domain experts. They also, they're in Minnesota. <laughs> they know what Goodhue County is. I don't. I've, it was the first time I encountered it was on our website. So they have um, the local uh, expertise, and also they're professionals, right? They're libraries and museum curators and archivists who really have professional subject domain knowledge to be able to actually flesh out the descriptive metadata and to put it into, properly into the system. You know, there are librarians on the local level in the U.S. The U.S. has 16,000 public libraries in the U.S., and a lot of those have these small local collections. So there are librarians operating at the local level 
But what the hub does is come in and make sure that everything is rigorously added into the data set from those local places. So it really is a collaboration that's not just about technical infrastructure, it really is about the human infrastructure that exists across the country and making sure that that all blends together as well. Community building and collaboration are extremely difficult and um, I, I think that's frankly why the project is succeeding is that we've we found a way to do it. I think part of it is the model itself. So we could have had a different model which is send all your stuff to Boston. <laughs> We're based in Boston, we're just gonna be imperial and we'll just get all the material and just put it on a server in Boston and, and that will be it. Instead, what we decided is to take a community approach and to keep local control of the materials. And I think that that was very important, at least in our country, it may be different in Finland. Well, I think um, uh, you know a lot of it is about culture and mission, right? So uh, I think if we were doing a different kind of mission that wasn't um, really a, a public benefit mission, right? I mean, what's great about waking up in the morning and working for the DPLA is we're doing this great mission where we're providing open access to millions and millions of items to school kids and the general public, and that's great. So I think when people hear about that mission, we actually have people knocking on our door to become hubs. There's actually an influx of places. Um, uh, so that we don't have to, you know, twist arms to get people involved. So I think that's part of it. And then another part of it um, so is the mission, and then I mentioned the culture. And I think the culture part of it is really important, where we really listen to our hubs. We, we really try to think about what are their needs. You know, we hear back from them regularly. We have a regular newsletter that goes out once a month. Um, that Amy Rudersdorf, our assistant director for content um, rights, which is called the Hub Date. Um, so it's the Hub Update. Um, and we send out information about the project. We love to get feedback from them. So I think it's got to have that feel of a two way street where the local entities are not just you know, participating in National Network, but um, are really an active part of the community in shaping the direction of the project itself. You know, I think that, first of all, the, the people involved in DPLA are their public servants, right? I mean, they are already in the business of working for institutions that look a lot like DPLA itself. Nonprofit, non-commercial, public serving, um, open, all of these things are part of their core values to begin with. So I, I think their incentive is, not, is obviously not monetary uh, to be in, involved in it, but I think it's um, in some sense a, a spirit of openness and, and a public service that uh, really drives everyone involved. Well, I, and I, now I'll rewind and, and put on my hat as a historian. I mean, I was a history professor for 20 years, and what you really realize as a, as a professor is that people do learn and do research in different ways. There are some people who are incredibly visual. There are other people who are very text-oriented and find things better in that way. We try to have it both ways. When we have some interfaces that are extremely visual, and we have others that are, that are more textual, um, and and I, I just think you need to have all of that. The problem with modern library and digital library systems, and frankly the problem even with Google, is that it's still a sort of one size fits all kind of interface. Mm -hmm. Google tries to kind of infer that you may want a map or something like that sometimes if you enter a town name, but we can really um, provide to the user of our website you know, multiple pathways in uh, to our collection um, that match up with their approach. And if you ask any education professor, um, you know, they will, they will tell you that th this is the way people, you know, I mean, some people are just distinctly visual in their approach. Mm -hmm.